Let's go ahead and get started. So there's going to be a slight change up today. Uh, Santos will be doing his recitation tomorrow instead of today. We were hoping to get it done early, but there's still some, some technical bugs we needed to work out. We we're adding one more sample to the test set. Um, so we'll, he'll do the recitation tomorrow. Uh, labs, so the labs this week are beam buckling, which, um, and I guess the labs on, from last week, the torsion labs, are Monday lab is due today, Tuesday lab is due tomorrow, Wednesday lab is due day after. Uh, homework five, homework six, uh, is due tomorrow, whichever number of homework we're on now. Five? Five. Uh, four should be graded. <laughs> Hopefully, soon. I think I ended up giving it to the TAs, and I don't know where they're at on it yet. But, yeah, they're also grading your labs. I know. So, today we're going to talk more about buckling. Uh, I'll go through a couple conceptual examples, and then uh, go through some derivations for simple buckling cases. And I think tomorrow we'll probably get to the general case which I'll show you briefly, because I don't know how much detail I want to dig into it with. Uh, cool. So, all right. Last week we had talked, or we'd started our talk about buckling. And in general, buckling is an instability phenomena, so it's a snapping between two stable states. For this class, we'll be looking at beam buckling. So this is long slender beams that were, or long slender columns that we're applying a uniaxial load to. And you can see uh, what's, what's happening when we're compressing these things is it's snapping between a uniaxial compressed state and a bent state. So um, that snapping between states is an energy switching. So uh, at some point, it takes less energy to bend this thing than it does to compress it uniaxially. And when that energy point switches over, that's when it'll snap to this new state. And so we had given one main equation for buckling. Uh, so all of our all of our thin column buckling, we're going to be doing with Euler buckling analysis, which uh, I'm going to say the critical load for that is pi squared ei over kl squared, where k is an effective length vector, effective length factor, which is equal to one for a pinned 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 column, uh, zero point five for a fixed fixed column, uh, two for a fixed free column and like 0 0.69 for a fixed pinned column. And so this is the one main equation that we'll need for most of our buckling analysis. In the buckling, or when we, when we are taking a rod that is buckling, we have to think about when that transition to buckling will occur. So I also showed that transition to buckling, we defined the critical stress for buckling is the P critical uh, over your area. Let's call this a transition. Uh, and then I defined a new term that I'm going to call my slenderness, which is equal to square root of L squared A over I. Wrote my sigma critical. Let's move this all up. Uh, sigma critical as pi squared e i over uh, k squared l squared a, which is equal to pi squared e over k squared s squared here. And I said, I showed that there would be some, or I, I said that there would be some transition if I have a really short stubby column that's not going to buckle, where this short stubby column will preferentially um, yield instead. And that transition happens where when, uh, when this critical stress is equal to the yield stress. So when sigma critical is equal to sigma yield, I get uh, my 
slenderness transition is equal to uh, pi over k square root of e over sigma. And then showed a plot of the critical stress at different failure points, stress for failure at dif for different slenderness values, said that for low slenderness, we were just going to follow the yield strength of the material. So when it's, uh, when it's a column, basically, you're just going to yield as a normal column would. And then at some point, you have this Euler buckling limit come in, where this Euler buckling limit, uh, this is sigma is equal to pi squared e over k squared s squared. So this is a 1 over square root dependence. And in your lab, this is what you're going to be testing. So we'll be taking two rods of different, two rods with different materials. So uh, an aluminum and a steel rod. So different E's and different sigma yields. And then we'll be changing the length of them. So we'll be keeping, I think we'll give you five specimens total, or no, sorry, 10 specimens, five for each one. Uh, and you'll basically be trying to find out what the what the peak stress is and whether it's in a, a yielding or buckling regime and then try to plot out some space like this and so that's uh, what Santosh will go through that analysis with you more tomorrow uh, when we have a slender beam just as a really quick aside uh, when we have a slender beam in buckling when you're looking at the load displacement response uh, so this is displacement D versus load. So um, this is when I have load. Let's call load P. P. So if I'm applying a P and I'm looking at some D going down, what I would expect is a linear elastic response initially and then a buckling plateau where this, depending on exactly how slender you are, could kind of drop off suddenly like that. It could kind of gradually plateau. It could actually harden a little bit. So you have some intermediate behavior between one of these. But what you're looking for when you're doing this type of analysis is you're looking for that critical stress, or critical load, sorry, when uh, the beam starts to change shape. And so in the lab, that's what you'll be looking at when this starts to pop over. Actually, except for the lab, you'll have a, a fixed, fixed end condition. So it'll look something more like this. But, um, so this exact shape depends on what the end conditions are and the slenderness of the beam. But this is, this is the, the type of plot that you'll be analyzing for the lab. Cool. Um, Questions on stuff in there before we get into some conceptual questions. Yeah. Where did the effective length come from? Ooh, good question. So I'll actually go through. The, I'll go through the proper analysis to show you where we derive those, um, and I'll do that. I think today I might no tomorrow I'll get through some of that actual analysis. And it involves uh, actually the beam bending ODE with a combined axial term. And I'll kind of work my way up to showing you how we get that. But what you can think of it as uh, is when we, all, all of those effective lengths are compared to uh, the pinned pinned buckling case. So all of them are relative to this, uh, the, with this pin pin case, which is the simplest buckling case. And we say that this has a length of one. And so then the effective length, quote unquote, of all the other ones is, is the length relative to this. So if I have a fixed free beam that's buckling, the shape that it takes on is something like that, which then if I were to mirror that, this is, uh, you can see that this is half of the shape of this pinned pinned beam. So then the effective length even though the actual length here is L, the L effective is 2L. 
so that's why for my for my fixed free condition I say that that effective length is 2L because the critical load is is one quarter uh, what the pin to pin case is for a fixed fixed beam mm, where do I want to draw this I'm gonna draw this over here and just take up more space in the middle uh, for a fixed fixed beam this is an exaggerated buckled shape um, but you can say like here even though the length is L here the L effective uh, is 0 0.5 times L because it, that, that middle section of the beam looks like the pinned pinned buckling case and so this is what we're call what we're defining our effective length relative to cool other questions yeah well, what did you say B was again on that graph of the P versus B? Uh, this is just displacement so this is the the data you'll be getting out of an instron load displacement um, and you'll see some behavior like this which you could normalize out to be stress strain I guess stress or strain doesn't really make sense in this case for buckling uh, only for yielding it would but um, as and the one to the left the stress versus S the, the S also displacement or is that normalized to be uh, this is slenderness so this is basically here in it for a low slenderness I have kind of a short stubby beam and for a high slenderness I have a very long skinny beam and so it's defining the the aspect ratio of the beam effectively and it's saying the critical stress where this where this peak load will be or the peak stress because you could just divide it by area is uh, is going to be either the yielding strength or the buckling limit is that displacement the horizontal distance or the vertical compression vertical compression yeah uh, when we do our analysis we will use lateral displacement for like a beam and bending but for this case like the data that you will get out of an instrument is axial compression so it's this distance that I'm compressing this thing in okay cool so uh, I threw a whole bunch of equations at you all and now I'm going to ask a couple conceptual questions about those equations um, that we'll see how well uh, probably could have tailored these slightly better so I'm going to do some poll everywhere stuff so for the first one I'm going to ask you about three different be or three beams with the same length uh, different cross-sectional areas or different cross-sectional shapes so the areas of these are the same um, the areas in, of, in the black regions and the lengths are the same but I want you to think about now which of these cross sections would be most resistant and least resistant to buckling so out of those three which one would out of these three cross sections which is the hardest to buckle like you're already doing it. Take a few more seconds and talk to your neighbors about it. Convince each other why you chose the answer you chose.
kids have been there. I can't remember how, but like <laughs> at school, some kind of like some of the like summer people pressure so like you can make a paper and it's like just the paper and you can make a cylinder. So I don't know if there's that high but I feel if it's if it's actually Okay, let's bring it back together. So it looks like almost all of you have B. Why, or why did you choose, or yeah, why, why do you think B might be the right answer for those who picked it? Because it has the highest moment of inertia in every direction. Yes, because it has the highest moment of inertia in every direction. So we have wants to change over there we go cool yeah so we have the critical load that we need for buckling pi squared ei over kl squared so the e is the same the l is the same i guess i didn't say it explicitly but the boundary condition is the same so we're looking for basically the material highest area moments of inertia which would be higher for a hollow circle than a than a normal circle um i guess on that and the next question what would have the lowest area moment different, or what, which would have the lowest um, critical stress to buckle? So out of those three. This is the, these are the three cross sections again. Just as a reminder, which I may have screwed up all of your poll everywhere. So I apologize. back together. <coughs> so why would that rectangular cross section, which it looks like most of you have again, why would that necessarily have the lowest stress to buckle? Or the lowest load to buckle? Sure. Why not? <laughs> because it has the lowest minimum moment of inertia, which is in the X direction. Yes. So I slightly missed or not misled, but told you a, a half truth when we were looking at um, this buckling equation, which will come up eventually. There we go. Um, when we looked at this buckling equation, because for a, a different cross section, if we have some arbitrary cross section, we have different area moments of inertia depending on which axis we're looking at. So we'll have some I around different axes of these things. And so for a rectangle, even though it has a very high moment of inertia in one direction, it has a very low moment of inertia in the other direction. So um, we need it to, uh, we, we, we need to look at the lowest area moment of inertia to figure out where the lowest peak load would be. Uh, similar to that, how would, uh, or I guess if with the same cross-sectional area, would a hollow square or a hollow circle have a higher or lower area moment of inertia with an equal area? I didn't actually have this as a pole everywhere one, but... Sure. 
Why the circle? Yeah, we could, we could. Yeah. So, uh, not quite. There's there's something in there like that. We could do a. We could probably like plug in equations and figure out equal areas and come up with an analytic relationship. But um, kind of intuitively, the the square you're biasing yourself to have a higher area moment along those diagonal axes versus the uh, versus the horizontal axes here. So it would be it would buckle in either this way or that way, um, but not along these angles. Whereas this is equal all the way around. So with the same area, this one is more likely to have a higher area moment uniformly, even though this one would have a higher area moment along certain directions. So because we're building, it, there's no anisotropy in our circle. But again, we could probably derive an analytic formula to show why this one for equal area would have a, a better or have a higher minimum area or have a higher area moment um, than the minimum of the square. <coughs> cool. So uh, the next one, so I showed this slenderness equation here or this, this slenderness relationship here and in your lab you shouldn't actually see things lining up perfectly along here. So um, I know I'm going to tell you this right off the bat. So I'm going to ask you to think now about specifically what might happen when we're kind of in this intermediate region, when we're kind of close to that um, critical transition, S transition, there we go, which I should have written earlier. When we're close to this transition slenderness, uh, what might be happening to the beam here? Uh, and do you expect the critical stress to be higher or lower than this? So, pull everywhere stuff. I left this as an open ended one. Take a few minutes, or take another minute, and talk about it with your neighbor or neighbors. Since 
Okay. <laughs> let's bring it back together. And let's hear some thoughts about what might happen when we're not quite at in, in that high slenderness Euler buckling regime, but we're kind of close to that transition value. What do you think might be taking place? <coughs> a whole lot of talking. So I know somebody has thoughts on these things. Not all the ones. <laughs> sure. Right. So I guess what we were thinking is that if you were just below the critical slenderness threshold, so you're just on the edge of buckling, if there are no imperfections, it shouldn't buckle. However, if you do have like the voids in it, then it will have like this instantaneous lower moment of inertia because of like a lack of material. Uh -huh. That would cause it to like buckle in that one little instance, and then that would cause the entire thing to buckle. But we're not. Okay. Really sure. That's a good way of thinking about it. I think you're, that is a possibility. <laughs> I, yeah. So you, you think it would still buckle? It depends how close it is to the critical threshold. Okay. How about any other thoughts from people? I see a lot of, it, she almost thick. What is <laughs> What? <laughs> uh, okay. I I see a lot of it will buckle something bad, lower critical stress. I have a question that's not really an answer, but uh, if it's if it's around that point, would there be like any vibrations if the if the beam is like kind of moving between those those things, or would it just kind of stick? Um, to one, one, one point or the other? Uh, it could. It would generally stick to one point or the other. Mm -hmm. And you'll you'll see examples of this in your lab. Mm -hmm. So we'll be testing some some that are kind of close in there. Uh, but I, I guess there are situations where you could hit a fluttering instability. Um, but I don't think it would happen normally. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So what would generally happen and which what is what I would expect or what I what I expect you all to see in your lab is you'll get some mix of yielding and buckling. So you won't actually see this exact line, but you'll see something that kind of drops along there. And so actually in this whole kind of intermediate region, you probably won't see uh, something that's perfectly Euler buckling or perfectly yielding. We'll be getting some weird combination of the two. Uh, and there's a fit for this that I'm going to tell you, but I'm not actually going to talk about today. Um, called Johnson's parabolic uh, fit. I think fit. Something like that. Uh, we're basically, so the Euler buckling equation came out in 1757 from Leonard Euler in 1900-ish. Uh, this, this guy, Johnson, came up with a, uh, a fit to say, well, there's supposed to be this there's behavior, but this isn't what we actually see experimentally. So he was basically like, well, I can kind of fit the slope of this thing here and fit the slope of this thing here and say, in this sort of intermediate region, I'm getting some buckling and some yielding and the peak stress is some strange combination of those two, and I'm just going to have a fit between there. Um, so there's not a great, there, there's an equation for it, um, but I'm not going to necessarily talk about because it, it hasn't, it's not analytically derived, it's all kind of empirically obtained. Um, but this is the type of behavior that I would expect you to see. And when I think about this, um, I think there's a lot of 
interesting things that could be happening internally, but I, I think about it in terms of imperfections. So when you start yielding a material plastically, remember we have um, that hardening or potentially hardening, potentially softening behavior of a material, of the constituent material. When that buckling happens, you're going to get a small area, maybe that has an imperfection, maybe that has a void, maybe that just starts to soften locally where plastic deformation is happening. Um, and instead of this uh, nice buckling behavior at some P critical, what you're going to get is a slow deviation from that, depending on how big your uh, imperfection is. So I think somewhere in your homework, I actually asked a question about this. And in the notes, I had linked a book, um, R.M. Jones, Buckling of Plates and Shells. That it's, a, it's Most of the book is on Google Books, so you can look through it. Um, but there's a section where he talks about imperfections in bent beams. So that's basically saying, if I have a perfectly straight beam, I, I have that Euler buckling load. But if I have something that's you know slightly off, initially that's slightly imperfect, which all of your samples will be, nothing is a perfectly straight beam, then it'll drop the peak stress where you expect to see buckling. So you'll get not necessarily that exact critical stress, but you'll get something lower than it. And so there's this interesting complex combination of, of these behaviors going on when you're in this transition region. When you're super slender, it's just going to oil or buckle. When you're super short and stubby, it's just going to be yielding. And then when you're in that intermediate range, that's where interesting things happen, which is what the analysis for the lab is going to be. So is the Johnson's parabolic fit the reason that you need the safety factor as far as like the thickness? Because it's never going to like really be right at the edge of the, the like yield strength? Yeah. Thing. So you're never actually, like for design, you would want to, if you wanted a beam that didn't necessarily buckle, you would be like, oh, let's just make it like lower than the that transition slenderness. And then our structure shouldn't buckle. Like if you were building a, a I don't know, some sort of a truss frame for a bridge or reinforcement for a for a hull or something. But the actual stress that that's going to have is, is lower because you still have that Euler buckling taking place after um, after that instability starts because of imperfections and because of other stuff. Yeah, good question. Cool. So I have one fun conceptual question before, before we get into stuff. Can you buckle a beam in tension? not a straight beam. Can you buckle anything in tension? Maybe. So, uh, I've linked this video now on <coughs> on the Canvas page for the lecture notes this time. So uh, this is a cool example by a professor, David Bigoni, at uh, University of Trento in Italy. Uh, he's talking about buckling theory. There's some of the equations that we saw. He has this nice setup where he shows all those different buckled shapes. But then the question is, can you buckle something in tension? And he came up with this <coughs> cool, simple demo where you actually can. So if you take a beam and you add a slider there in the middle of it, I don't have a uh, volume on, so I'm gonna say what he's saying. If you put a slider here in the middle, you actually have another stable state that this can snap into. Uh, he puts a spring here at the end so that it's there's some energetic, uh, th some energetic energetically favorable reason to stay in this state. Otherwise, it would just kind of slip and slide around randomly. Um, but then with that spring there, there's some amount of energy that prevents it from snapping into this state. And you can actually come up with a P critical where it will snap into that buckled state in tension. And somewhere through the video, he shows this simple setup that he has designed where he now puts weights on this thing.
till eventually, there we go, and it buckles in tension. Has it now with a, an Instron load cell set up? Yeah. There we go. Now this is pulling in tension, and eventually it buckles into a new stable state. So you can still, this, this idea of bifurcations, of snapping between stable states, can happen for a whole bunch of different load cases. And tension, I mean, for a long time, I didn't think you could tensile buckle something until I saw this. And I was like, oh, you can. It's kind of like two different specimens. It's not technically, it's a, yeah, technically, it's not a continuous okay. beam, sort of. I mean, what is? It's made so that the ends are still parallel. Yeah. Cool. So I have I have this video linked on the Canvas page for you to check out if you're interested. Um, so now in the last uh, ten minutes or so, I'm going to go through a real quick example of how you would do that sort of analysis, which is the the simplest version of beam buckling analysis. So what we want to look at, let's, uh, what we want to look at now is a, a simple model of a rigid rod with a, a spring connecting it. So okay, so we're going to look at <coughs> rigid rockling here. And so for this setup, I'm going to have a spring connected to a slider plate here that's then pin jointed to a rod that is grounded here. Uh, and what I'm going to say is, so the spring has some stiffness k, this rod has some length l, and I want to say now if I apply some force to the top of this, some force p, this will eventually snap into a new stable state where that stable state will have this spring extended uh, and the rod bent over. This is supposed to be straight. Straight rod bent over. There we go. Still grounded. <coughs> this still has a length L. This has now displaced by some amount delta y, which is L cosine theta. Uh, this is now uh, L, no, L sine theta. Did I mix that up? Y sine theta. L sine theta, sorry. And this is L cos theta here along the side for some angle theta in here. And I want to figure out how much load P I have to apply before this buckling happens. So to do that, I'm going to take a moment balance around this bottom point here. So I say now if I, if I take a sum of moments around the bottom, the, I have one moment P acting at a distance delta Y, so P delta Y away and then I have another reaction force from the spring and that reaction force from the spring is uh, the force is K delta Y which is my reaction force and it's acting at a distance L cosine theta away uh, and I'm going to say this hits some equilibrium when that system is equal to zero uh, I can replace my delta Y say this is PL sine theta minus KL squared sine theta cosine theta is equal to zero and then to simplify the analysis I'm gonna use a small angle approximation and say sine of theta is approximately equal to theta cosine of theta is approximately equal to one and then this becomes PL theta minus K L squared theta which I can pull stuff out of and say this is L theta P minus KL is equal to zero. <coughs> and so now I, I can say this system is stable, hits, hits a critical instability point 
So there, there's two solutions to this. I can either say my theta is zero, so my rod hasn't rotated at all, which is my what I'm going to call my trivial solution. And I can say there's some, it'll hit some new stable state when this moment balances itself. So when that p minus kl is equal to zero, or when p is equal to kl. So I have this critical transition between a uniaxial, or from my uniaxially compressed state and my buckled snap state here when I have uh, this p critical is kl. And so this, in that uh, video for tension, this is the, I guess, a similar type of analysis where he's probably doing a simple uh, sum of moments, sum of forces analysis, and says uh, there's some, in his case, there's a torsional spring. In this case, we have an axial spring. There's some moment where if I have a spring pulling a rod that I'm pushing down, there's some point where it'll pop over to a new stable state. Um, and that stable state transition happens here when I hit some critical load. Yes, it would. It does seem weird. Uh, so it's because the the rod isn't actually so 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 the rod isn't carrying any load. This is an infinitesimal, infinitely rigid rod, and the only thing that is causing the transition is the fact that the spring has some stiffness. So if the rod is shorter, that k that the spring has to stretch less in the buckled state or in the, the second the bifurcated state. And so then what what this would look like now if I were to plot the the load displacement response or the sorry load angle response p theta. What I'm saying is there's some load path that I can follow where uh, I'm uniaxially compressing that rod and I'm getting no twist out. Sorry, let's move that up. Where I'm uniaxially compressing a rod and I'm getting no twist out. So this is my uniaxially compressed state. And at some point, I'm going to hit that P critical and I'm going to bifurcate out where it's going to start to start following this new state here. And if I'm, so this is this is now my my stable deformation path. So this is the path that it wants to follow. It wants to be loaded axially. When I hit that KL, it's going to deflect over here. Eventually, the spring is going to kind of keep deflecting. I have a the sine and the cosine. I could no longer take a small angle, and that load would start to increase. But if I tried to keep it from buckling, unstable, then I'm putting it on an unstable load path. So I'd, I'd be increasing the load up in a point where it doesn't want to be. So similar similar to our beam and buckling, if I can find that beam from buckling and I keep applying load, it's it wants to snap into that new state. And so when I release that confinement, you can see that it snaps into that buckled state. Here, this is a, a similar, slightly simpler example where I could keep compressing this rod axially and say my my angle doesn't change at all but when I get past a certain critical point it wants to pop into that new deformed shape energetically um, so tomorrow tomorrow's Wednesday so tomorrow we'll talk uh, we'll hopefully go through the the beam bending lab beam buckling lab recitation and I'll go through a more thorough derivation of how you get a buckling or the buckling equation the lab, still, the, lab, the lab time is still the same this week. Yes. It's still 2.30 for, um, for everybody who had their lab on Monday. You should be distributed now into whatever new group. Um, and I think almost everyone was able to find a spot there. <laughs> no, I guess it could pop in or out because the spring stiffness we're assuming is the same. Yeah, it's linear. Can you move it up just a little bit? Yes. Yeah.